episode 172 of CBP cast with guest Jens Vela, recorded October 18th, 2018. Today's sponsor of CBP cast is the PVS Studio team. PVS Studio can be considered both as a tool for finding errors and typos and a static application security testing tool. The tool supports the analysis of C, C++, and C Sharp code. In this episode, we discuss some of the new papers headed to the C++ committee meeting in San Diego. Then we talk to Jens Veller for Meeting C++. Jens talks to us about the upcoming Meeting C++ and Embedded conferences and much more. Welcome to episode 172 of CBP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Uh, don't really have any news myself to share. Do you have anything? Mm, no, I guess not. Not at the moment. Just okay. getting ready for the holidays and a bunch of travel and stuff. Yeah, yeah you're going to be busy for the next few months. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's have sort of like two piece of feedback. Uh, this week I actually got a tweet from Kate Gregory. Uh, she's out at Pacific Plus Plus right now. I think she's one of the keynoters there. Yes. And uh, she just took a picture of the sticker table, and I uh, actually gave her about like a dozen CPCast stickers when I saw her at CPCon, so she was able to uh, put those out on the table. That's fun. That's yeah. two years in a row that CPCast has been represented in some way. At Pacific Plus yeah. Plus. Yeah. Well, I hope, uh, hope that's a good conference. I'm sure that's only like a two-day conference, and I'm sure they'll be putting up videos pretty soon afterwards. I think that's right, two days, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbcast.com, and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us again today is Jens Veller. Jens is the organizer and founder of Meeting C++, doing C++ since 1998. He is an active member of the C++ community. From being a moderator at C++.de and organizer of his own C++ user group since 2011 in Dusseldorf, his roots are in the C++ community. Today, his main work is running the Meeting C++ platform. His main role has becoming has become being a C++ evangelist. As this, he speaks and travels to other conferences and user groups around the world. Jens, welcome back to the show. Hey, great to be back. Yeah, 2011, that has to be one of the longer-running C++ user groups, I'm thinking. Yeah, um, we are having our anniversary every year in December, so soon it's going to be seven years. And it's also kind of the root of the conference. Um, and the next year, I just realized that there's a user group I have, people which I would be interested to also run a conference and become like my staff and mostly my staff till today and um, meeting in, in Aspen and so many other folks from Germany and Europe which wanted to have a C++ conference, a true C++ conference in Europe, um, kind of got me motivated to do it the first time in 2012. That's pretty crazy, though, that you met up with many of your C++ German developers in Aspen. To, that's what you said, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, there, there's a group of European attendees every year oh, yes. at Aspen. Oh, yes. And so I was surprised by that, too, but they also were very supportive, and also John Cobb. That was a long time ago, 2012. Yeah. Well, I think if you were to look at our numbers for CBPcast, the percentage of people, the percentage of guests that we've had who are from Germany is unusually high, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've been at the user group in Berlin, which also exists since 2012, yesterday, I know, Tuesday. And they had like a full meeting and we were just hosting at some uh, startup which is doing something in sound technology with sound speakers and it was pretty cool. That's neat. Okay. Well, Jens, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these and then we'll uh, start talking to you about more recent news you've been making with Meeting C++, okay? Okay. 
Okay, so first one, uh, we have another article from uh, Fluent CPP, Jonathan Bokra's blog, and this one is why optional references didn't make it into C++17, and it kind of basically goes into an argument that was had in the C++ committee that they couldn't uh, come to a resolution on on what happens when you assign something to an optional reference, and apparently Boost made a decision, and, uh, you know, if you are using Boost optional, uh, it will work. You can use optional references, but it's not supported with uh, C++17. Yeah, and Jonathan has really, like, upped his game lately because the last article yeah. we had on here, he had Herb review it. This article was based on an interview that he had with the author of Boost optional. And I believe he's also at least one of the ones working on who worked on the optional proposal into the standard, right? Right. Yeah. I will say, like, I never really thought there was much of a controversy here, but then after reading it, yeah, I, I get it. And I have actually recommended yeah. to a few people lately, which it's it's very, very wordy, but you can do a standard optional of a standard reference wrapper. And at least there okay. is no ambiguity at all in this case. You know exactly what assignment should do or whatever in, in those cases. So, um yeah, maybe I'll just stick with recommending that for when you need that kind of thing. That's an interesting take, yes. I can understand that it's not in 17, that we just want to have some more time to to, to have types more established and to, to flesh out some of the design later and just have like a light version first. Um, and I kind of can understand both sides. I can understand that, you know, you want to have something like a reference and an optional, like just as acting like a reference, and I can understand that uh, optional still should act like an optional. Right. Do either of you have an opinion on you know whether we should be binding or not binding optional references if we did have it? Uh, my opinion would be that it should rebind if you were to assign yeah. an optional reference because that is consistent with. I mean, you are assigning the the underlying uh, the the thing that's being held, which is a reference, not the value. That's my opinion. But I totally see the argument. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next thing we have is the full list of the pre-San Diego uh, mailings. Uh, and it is a long list. I mean, it's two full pages of all the proposals that are to be discussed at San Diego. And I'll be honest, I, I don't recall seeing this type of list or looking at it. I'm, I'm sure it comes out before every meeting, but I don't remember looking at it before in the past. Is this a particularly lengthy list for uh, San Diego? It seems like it is. Well, just for the record, the link that you, we actually have in the show notes is just part one of two. Yeah, that's true. Okay. There's a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe it is the longest list yet, 265 per papers or something like that. Is yes. that right? Yes, it's 276 papers. Six. Um, actually, yesterday I went with my own user group and just it off through um, not not all of them. <laughs> we had to look at them and, you know, the interesting ones, the ones which we thought could be interesting. We looked at and some of them were uh, not, not every paper is like presentable and often I just uh, use the search function to, to jump to the point which was interesting for us at that moment. Like, you know, we had a module paper which is like, I don't know, lots of pages about modules and we were like what about macros and so we found out that and um there's there's a great paper which is the title down with type names okay um from nina Ranz and david van der Fort and um also yeah this is a very good paper and a very understandable removing type name in some situations where the compiler doesn't need it anymore makes uh, C++ more concise and has a bit of less typing for us as programmers. And this actually has a chance to go through. I talked on Monday when I was in Berlin with Fabio Fracassi, the German part of the delegation for uh, San Diego and other meetings from the committee. And um, he had a very good impression about this paper and also said, that uh, with David van der Voort, it comes from an implementer and uh, has a solid opinion on, on actually if this is like implementable and that would help in the committee. So is it implementable then, if there's an opinion on it? Um, 
Well, basically what he said is if, if, if David comes up with such a thing and writes a paper about it with, with a co-author, um, they probably only will make uh, additions or like remove r remove uh, the need for type name in situations okay. where we either not need it anymore. It's not like remove type name in total, just remove it in situations where it's actually not needed anymore. That is, a, I mean, for any of us who have been programming in C++ for any length of time, we know... Uh, how often the compiler tells us you need type name here. Well, yeah. if the compiler can tell you that we need type name there, then maybe we don't need type name there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Well, there are some situations which is just ambiguous without type name, and the other the other situations where the compiler could not tell us that we need type name there, but could do the right thing from the context, uh, we could get rid of type name. That's exactly the point of the paper. Right. I noticed. Any other? Oh, go ahead. No, oh, yeah, I was just going to say what what else I had noticed. <laughs> um, uh, John Heed has been prolific. He has got like four papers in flight right now, mm -hmm. and they're all related to things that I find interesting. There's a ton of context for things out there. We discussed one of them briefly with Hannah on the last episode. Yep. Um, and what else stood out to me? Oh, lib format, which I just covered in a C++ Weekly episode, is on its third draft of its paper for standardization. Yeah, that that might go into 20. That would be really cool. That would, and there's actually a talk about format at the upcoming conference um, at C++. Okay. I was, I've okay. been using it and I've been very pleased with the library. Uh, next article we have is a blog post from Richard Smith. Um, before CVVCon, he sent out this tweet saying, I'm running a mini contest during this year's CVVCon. Show me the most awful, surprising, horrific, inventive, well-formed C++ construct you can fit in a tweet. Best entry is judged by me, wins an iPad. And it looks like he got 40 entries, and he uh, posted them all here on his blog, made some comments about them, and the, uh, the winner was uh, Jonathan Mueller. Yes. Were there any particular uh, tweets you wanted to call out here, Jason? I seriously actually just read through all of these, and they are – some of them are gold. And I, this – so for those who don't know who Richard Smith is, he is the editor of the C++ standard. Yeah. So Richard has a special relationship with the standard that most of us do not have. And he has a couple of comments. One of them, he says, this is one of the few entries that had me reaching for my copy of the standard to double-check the rules. Yeah, I remember that one. Like, if Richard said that, it's probably something pretty goofy. And for that particular one, technically on only MSVC actually followed the spec and compiled the code, even though it was something that you really should never be doing in your code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's I, I like this entry from, from, from Donaldson, but also there was a lot of other good ones. Some of them, well... Maybe predictably for those of you who are on Twitter, uh, JF had many entries. Yeah, he had like three. <laughs> yeah. Tony had several. Yeah, he, had several. <laughs> he was like, well, a picture, a picture fits in a tweet, so I, I tweet a picture <laughs> of the code. <laughs> right. There's another one. It is absolutely horrific. I'm going to see if I can find it quickly. That uses a uh, non-compound... Um, a non-compound switch statement, which is technically allowed. No one would ever do it because you can have exactly one label in that case. But um, it's just brilliant, like, understanding of the lexical rules of the language in that one, which that's from JF. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the switch which combines, like, a do-while loop something. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that one. And it's all it's just... without any curlies in it, basically. So it's just like yeah. a jumbled mess of nonsense. It's all technically correct. Wonderful. Okay. And then the uh, last thing I wanted to mention, just that the uh, CBCon 2018 videos are continuing to come out. I think it was up to, like, 53 as of today. Oh, that's three more than when I last or maybe No, it's just 50. I'm sorry. Uh, but that's, like, a third of the videos, I would imagine. I think last something like that. Yeah, so they're well on their way to uh, publishing all these videos. Yeah, if you look at yeah, the current playlist for 2018 is 50 videos, and last year's 2017 was 139. 
Oh, plus all the lightning talk videos they haven't done. Yeah, plus yet. the lightning talk should be over 200 probably yeah. by the time it's done this year. And imagine the lightning talks are a lot easier to publish. They're just focusing on the full uh, content videos first. I don't know. I would imagine. I mean, that each one's only five minutes talks long. Are harder. Each one's only five. Yeah, minutes it's only long, five though. minutes. Yes, it's only five minutes long. But from the perspective of the person uploading it to YouTube, it takes the exact same amount of work as an hour and a half long video. Sure, but the editing process is shorter. Right. Yeah. Well, I think the lightning talks are just recorded on block. So you have one hour of lightning talks or like the whole evening of lightning talks in one video file, and then you need to cut them, cut up. them up in the single lightning talks. And so it's probably a lot um, more effort to do them, and maybe That's they're just true. releasing the, the talks first because it's just one hour recording, break, breaking rec the recording. Um, actually, that's that's how I know it from how I get the video files from from my company. Right. And then I just have to edit it together. And so the the lightning talks I usually do first because I get to use the video tools. And so if I just you know have a learning effect there and learn something new, I just mess up a lightning talk and not the video <laughs> talks or keynotes. Right. <laughs> Okay, well, since you're, you're talking about your conference, uh, Meeting C++ is coming up soon, uh, November 15th to 17th. Uh, first of all, for listeners who are interested, is there still time to buy tickets? Um, probably not. Oh, okay. So there's a waiting list where you can uh, register an account and enter yourself on the waiting list. But as I'm talking, the last tickets are probably selling today or tomorrow. And then when listeners are actually are able to, to hear us, um, there's going to be a waiting list, and I might be able to, raise a, to release a few more tickets, but uh, it looks like that we are going to be 666 uh, attendees at the conference this year, and that's it. That's, that's how much we can pack in the conference, and next year we're probably going to go in a different setting, a different layout for the, con for the main floor, and then we can go beyond that. So 666 was your cap, and you have sold out, basically. Yes. That's... um. That's a pretty good sized conference, and uh, so you're still talking about um, staying in the Anders then next next year. Yes, but with a different yes, layout. We, we we can go to 750 to 800 in the Anders, and and so that's um, what I plan to do. But then we have to go in a different layout, so it's not anymore how how I, we used to have the conference in the last years. Then we just have to change how we play. Um, and then the, the basically we um, rotate the chairs and everything of uh, like a uh, degree to the okay. And then so you would actually be able to fit more rooms in basically. Yeah, the room because of the way the, the room dividers the, the, work. The current the current break area would not be a break area anymore. Then that's just seats. Right. So um, what keynotes do you have lined up for your talk this uh, for your conference this year? So there's three keynotes. Uh, the opening keynote is Andre Alexandrescu, and his title for the keynote is What is the Next Big Paradigm? Hmm. Then Lisa Lippincott, The Truth of a Procedure, and Nikolai Yuzutis is doing the closing keynote with the title Fifty Shades of C++. <laughs> uh, I'm slightly terrified about that one. Nikolai's last couple of... Uh... Conference talks have been about some of the terrible issues we have with initialization and that kind of thing. So, I wonder where yes. he's going to go with that. Yeah, I wonder too. It's just, I hope it will be a great keynote. This is uh, uh, Nikolai is really delivering there in the last years and um, knows his stuff out, out and very well. C plus plus where like you know where the quirks are and what to improve. Right. So. I'm also very curious what um, Andre's talk, what is the next big paradigm? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I have no idea. I usually only know the titles or keynotes. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. speakers send me a description, but I think like the counterpoint to a keynote is just that you should not like kind of be influenced by a description or something, that just have expectations, just listen to the speaker. Yeah. And yeah. It should be something inspirational, makes you maybe reconsider how you're programming or something. I think as well. That's uh, but yeah, that that could be interesting. Uh, 
sounds like a good lineup for sure. And Lisa always delivers. Is is this her first time coming to meeting C++? Yes. Okay. Her talks are always very popular at C++ now, I know. Yeah. And this is also going to be the first year of Meeting Embedded. Uh, can you tell us about that conference? Yeah, so I started a new platform with Meeting Embedded, which is basically uh, kind of what I do with Meeting C++ for the embedded area. So I also have like a listing of user groups there and start to build this up. And this year is like the first time we make... Uh, or this year is the first time where this as a conference happens. Um, more details on meetingembedded.com. And regarding the program, there will be nine talks about Embedded and a keynote by Dan Sachs, uh, which I did just an interview with uh, on the beginning of October. And it's a mix of Embedded and Embedded C++. And that is the day before meeting C++? Yes, I will have this conference in the coming years, like as one day before the main conference. Okay. Uh, do you know how many people are choosing to come to both conferences? Uh, some do. Some do. Okay. I have honestly, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at meeting embedded to see like what kind of user groups and how uh, prolific it is. But it's it's not C plus plus specific, right? It's anyone that does embedded development with a flavor of C plus plus, maybe. Yes, so C++ is welcome, but I aim really at the embedded sector and not just like aim at embedded C++. But of course, as I you know have built up meeting C++ and there's a lot of embedded developers in that, um, of course, C++ has its home there. And um, But also, we, we have a talk on Rust, we have a talk on tooling, we have uh, one talk about uh, how she designed the workshop for Arduino. Um, so there's a lot of interesting talks which cover a lot of things. Okay. And are those talks going to be recorded and put on YouTube as well? Yes. Uh, I plan to record those talks too and then share them on the Meeting C++ channel. Well, and since you just said Meeting C++ is sold out, is Meeting Embedded sold out? No, there are still tickets available uh, for a Meeting Embedded. Also, maybe you just want to quickly plug here Nikolai's uh, workshop on the 14th is also having so available spaces. So if you are in Berlin and want to partake on the workshop with Nikolai, that's possible. Oh, then we should talk about the workshops for a minute because I don't think we've mentioned that really. How, Where do the workshops come in and play in this and how does that all work out? Um... Well, there's on the 14th a workshop about modern C++ and template programming by Nikolai. Okay. And, um, yeah, we just started talking in spring, and Nikolai was like, I, I could do a training. I was like, okay, I, I have to ask the hotel if they have a room, and if that's if that's available, let's do it. And so there's, uh, on the 14th, a full-day training available with Nikolai. Um, it's also on the website. Um which you can still partake in. Then the embedded conference is the other option on the 14th. Oh, okay. So they happen concurrently, and then the next day is meeting yes. C++. Yes. Okay. Now, one of the talks that I, I couldn't help but notice uh, that you have coming up for meeting embedded was from Wooter, and I have to admit, uh, even though I've heard his name pronounced correctly several times, I still get a little lost with the Dutch name there, uh, that he is... Uh, planning a talk called We Stopped Teaching C. And that one really stood out to me because that's a nice um, tie-in with Kate's talk from several years ago, I think. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that talk. And I think that Wooder would be a great guest for your show. Um, so as far as I know, the college where Wooder works at switched recently from teaching C to C++, also probably because he's involved in this a little bit. And so um, he's going to t to talk about why they switched and how they switched. And in my opinion, it's just yeah, that sounds like a a good uh, idea, Rob. We should try to see if we can get him on. He uh, he came yeah, to a fun. talk that I gave in the Netherlands, and I like I saw him in the audience. Like I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to recognize you, but I can't remember why. I felt terrible that I didn't recognize him <laughs> until after the talk, but got the chance to catch up with him again. And the only other time we had met was at meeting C++ last year. I'd like to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Authors of the PVS Studio Analyzer suggest downloading and trying the demo version of the product. Link to the distribution package is in the description of this podcast episode. You might not even be aware of the large number of errors and potential vulnerabilities that the PVS Studio Analyzer is able to detect. 
A good example is the detection of errors that are classed as CWE14 according to the common weakness enumeration. Compiler removal of code to clear buffers. PVS Studio creators demonstrated the detection of such an error type, for example, in one of the latest articles. We check the Android source code by PVS Studio, or nothing is perfect. Link to this article is also in the description of this episode. PVS Studio works in Windows, Linux, and macOS environments. The tool supports the analysis of C, C++, and C Sharp code, and Java support is coming soon. Try it today. Uh, one of the newer resource, uh, resources on meeting C++ that I don't think we've talked about before is a uh, jobs and recruiting section. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So I started rebuilding and building meeting C++ as a platform this year, and one of the first features that launched in spring and in August uh, is the new sub job section. Um, it consists of three parts. So there's the, the regular job postings, um, and there's a form where you actually can post your open positions to Meeting C++ for free. On other job-related platforms, it's usually costs just for you know, posting something for 30 days on them. Um, and then there's two commercial offers um, which are targeted at employers for C++. Um, first, there's the employer listing where you are listed in the employer section at Meeting C++ with your profile. And also your logo will be visible in every in the job section, every job posting, uh, which is done at Meeting C++. And then there's another offering called Meeting C++ HR, which uh, is basically you receive re resumes which are directly through Meeting C++ uploaded in a CV upload form, which is live since August. Okay, so C++ developers can upload their CVs, basically, and have their information available for recruiters who are looking for positions. Yes. Okay. So kind of like... I'd, oh, sorry, go ahead. I distribute this to companies which are interested in doing this or interested in receiving that. So this is an offer which you can... And, and on the other hand, companies which partake in this support me through this. This is another free service. Um, as I mentioned. And so, yeah, it's, the model is uh, someone is looking for a job, they upload the CV uh, to to my site, and they get to choose to which companies they want to send that. Oh, there's, I see. Oh, at, the, okay. at the heading, there's just the field of companies where you just can click on this, 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 this company. Uh, you can put in your, your, your cover letter, you upload your, your resume, you then click send, and this then generates a little bit of input for what I have to do, and you have to check it, and then I send it to uh, the companies involved, and then they look at your resume, and if they think that's a fit, they're going to contact you. And so, um, that sounds. I mean, uh, I th I, I want to say more human than most uh, job res websites. That there's someone actually kind of involved looking at this a little bit. Um, can Can you talk at all publicly about what companies are currently involved? Um, yeah, well, it's on the on the on the form. You can see it on the form right now. It's uh, Thinkthel, um, TeamViewer, and some other companies. Okay. So, what kind of response have you gotten so far from this new service? Um, I still have to promote this more, and right now we're still like in the startup, so there's not a lot of companies to choose from. And I hope to have more companies on board, which uh, will happen in the future, I guess. And also, it's probably more easy to use that form for you. And um, I still have to promote it a bit better. And so far, I've seen like uh, once a week someone uploading their CV. Okay. And okay. once I promote it, I, I want to, to write to my attendees about this too. Uh, and so I guess there's going to be a lot more usage on that for the future. Well, yeah, if you get that directly out to the 700 approximately people that will be at your conference, plus yes. whoever's listening to this episode, I'm, I imagine we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Make sure you get that to us. Um, I expect I you would see some more res uh, yeah, uh, some traffic yeah and if, if if your employer could be interested in that just you can contact me and I'll just get you up with that okay that's uh, yeah that sounds like a good opportunity I know um, at least right here in the Denver area right now the C++ job market's good for developers I know companies who have had a hard time finding people yes so um, Yay for us. <laughs> it's, it's the same in Germany. It's the same in Germany, and it's uh, most of my sponsors are also kind of looking for folks 
if they're not like having tools like JetBrains and some other companies, acute companies there, which also you know is looking for developers, but also has a product. Um, but there's a lot of companies coming to contacting me and talking to me uh, for the job market, and I'm trying to to offer them a service. And that's one of the things I started noticing last year is um, the conference itself is now one percent of my total reach on social media, etc. And I have to find ways to offer this reach which I have to companies, uh, just to make them uh, make it available to in, in, in a form that I'm not selling things. So that's why I designed it, and I, I'm planning to also have different other things which I'm just going to talk to you probably in, in a few minutes about. Right. Um, so there's still a lot of things I plan to do, and some some things are just already like in, in a state that I can talk about it. Okay, you just said. Did you say 1% of your total meet reach is the conference? So I, I, it's been a while since I've looked, but last time I looked, your Twitter follower reach is just uh, order of magnitude beyond what most other C++ people have. Do you know approximately yes. what it is right now? Uh, yeah, it's, it's around 16,000. Then there's 5,000 on LinkedIn or over 5,000 on LinkedIn. Oh, wow. Uh, then I have 6,000 on Xing. I have il over 11,000 on YouTube. And there's something like 28,000 on Facebook. Wow. And Google Plus is still online, so there's That's another three. For like another week, right? Yeah, I thought they yeah. took it down already. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, last thing, last time I looked, it was still online. But yeah, so um, I just started realizing uh, last year. Uh, one thing I never talked about was like I talked about that at the conference. Um, I learned last year like there's there's this one thing where as a C plus plus developer you're so used to, and I learned this like really dangerous. Um, if you kind of have some similar situation in the real world, so. Um, you're like you only pay for what you use and I had a big room contingent last year and it didn't get fully used up so I still had to uh, cover a few uh, nights uh, with the hotel which, which weren't sold mm. and um, I, I learned from that last year that I have to better communicate um, with, with my attendees about making sure that they book over the hotel contingent and how to book there, how to book correctly, because some people are just, well, we booked on the hotel, and that counts. No, it doesn't. Right. Um, if, if you don't go over the right form, um, then maybe this booking doesn't count, or I just have to talk to the hotel. It was like really, and uh, for, on the other hand, it was for me interesting to see how the hotel would handle that. And they did handle it very much like, well, it's in the contract, and we'd like you to pay that. And <laughs> I could. But I thought, well, I have to, to change. And I also, also wanted to um, – I want to make meeting C++ every year better. And I also want to strive not to only be a conference because it's always – you know, I've done work for the user groups. I've done other things. I've started uh, this review platform for libraries last year, which uh, was not the big success. So I found out, like, just this year mm. that I don't actually have the time to continue that. I need to focus – on actually finding ways to um, go further and also to to reach the other 99% which I have in, in my network and to basically um, offer services to companies which are able to just, you know, uh, also get a better uh, way. So right now, most of the my work is, is uh, founded by... Uh, the income from the conference, and in the long run, I want to uh, kind of um, have meeting C++ run on different sources of income, and one of those incomes is uh, the revenue I get from uh, the companies which pay for the listing and at meeting C++. And um, I have a Patreon now uh, since this year and some other uh, sources and some other ideas which I'm just working at, and then uh, meeting C++ will offer like a lot of services um, in that manner, right? To to kind of counteract the risk which of conference banks. Well, since you uh, discussed that, you said a moment ago that there are upcoming things that you want to discuss. So, what what do you have planned for next? Um. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that. Um. So, one big thing I had to take care of this year was GDPR. 
because I was last year having like some tiny login system because I needed some internal tools for the conference. Right. And then I wanted to kind of make this more public, uh, like a newsletter thing and some other things, some other services. Um, but then GDPR came in and for like two months I had to learn what GDPR means for me and how to <laughs> handle that and how to implement the things which GDPR mandates to, to my platform. So I made some, some hard decisions. I said, well, handling emails is now a lot more important than in the past, but I also want them to be safe. So every uh, email which is in the account system at meaning C++ is encrypted now. Uh, and the passwords are also, of course, uh, hashed in, in a password hasher, which is by, in PHP. So that's safe. Um, and so one of the things... I've recently worked on is um, like things like a new lightning talk form, which I'm going to launch soon for my attendees. There's a password reset form, which I thought would be kind of good to have for the accounts. Um, a form for guest posts on the blog is there. So if you want to have, if you want to do guest posting on my blog, that's now an easy form to fill out mm. and send. Um, and last Friday, I was redoing the schedule in Moron CSS. It's now not or anymore based on a HTML table. It's now based on CSS grid. And therefore, it's like really dynamic in, in any matter and any size where you ever want to look at it. It's behaves a lot better now, uh, which is really great. Um, and then there's one feature which probably is kind of interesting for Jason. Uh -oh. Um I'm currently working on a new idea which is will make it possible to find C++ trainings through Meeting C++. Oh, okay. Okay. So I plan to launch this feature at the conference, and you can then go into the details. Um, so right now you can register as a trainer, and then... Um, there is also a form to request a training, and then I still have to write code to connect both of them. And at the end, um, I currently have the model that I'm probably, you know, transparently also. It's if you register as a trainee, trainer, you can see that that I'm basically uh, charging the trainers if they're chosen from for to do the training um, a certain percentage from what they offered. So that's transparently clear, so they can just incorporate that in their prices. And said in that way, I hope to have a platform where many trainers can, you know, be connected to the companies which actually are looking for trainings. Um, because one, I, I used to be a trainer too. And one of the reasons I got out of the market was that there's a lot of uh, agencies which are similar working like the freelancing agencies mm -hmm. where you just, where, where, where they're just looking for a trainer. And they take kind of the trainer which thinks is the best fit or the cheapest one, and they they, they charge like double. I think. And that's not like. And then there's people like uh, Jason, I think, who doesn't go through uh, agencies anymore or not that much, but probably you know has enough trainings to do. I almost did once. <laughs> <laughs> but then you declined. Uh, they never responded to me, and since then, I yeah. Well, I mean, we had a conversation for like three weeks, and then they stopped responding for whatever reason. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's. It seems like something I, I imagine a lot of people will take advantage of because I, I know that several people have asked me about how to get into training. So if there's yeah. like a common platform for this, yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I try to make this a common platform. Like meeting C plus plus should, you know, be more offer more to the community and also then um, this the commercial ecosystem which is backing C plus plus, where companies can go find them uh, find new, new employee, employees or you know post job postings and um, otherwise just find trainings. And also, I, I'm probably going to have something similar in that for freelancers next year. So there's going to be a whole marketplace uh, in, in, in meeting C++ in the future. Sounds interesting. For C++, yeah. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. And it sounds like it'd be a great resource for, you know, companies and employees who maybe don't even know how to look for trainers in the first place, aside from just reaching out to someone directly. Yes. And I try to kind of um, 
put some of the money which I make through this training platform then into advertising for the trainings platform and other things. Um, and also I kind of have to not make the full impact I need for running the company and meeting C++ from the conference so I don't need to uh, make the tickets more expensive and I still can afford to give away 50 free tickets which also today is a deadline for um, each year meeting C++ gives away uh, 50 free tickets which is 25 tickets for students and up to 25 tickets for uh, diversity and people who need support in a financial way to come to the conference. So, I, uh, to be clear, like literally today, October 18th is the last day for that. Yes. Okay. Today, mid okay. So by the time this airs, it'll be too late, unfortunately. Yes. But, yeah. uh, okay. Well, um, when we were at CVCon, we talked to you during our Lightning Talk interview about uh, the Qt project you were working on. Was there more you wanted to share about that project? Uh, yeah, we can just shortly talk about it. Um, so I have not been able to work on this for weeks now, um, but I was I was at CPPCon and I was sitting in this one really interesting talk from Jason about I think it's called CPP Box. Oh yeah, the, the C++ computers. box. Yeah, yeah. And and one of the uh, things you said and that was like you need a project to work on. I was like yes, yes. Uh, that's that's a good idea. That's I I just also want to work with Conan and uh, make make a new C++ 17 based project. Uh, it would be really fantastic to to use this uh, work which I did this year. Um, to rewrite one of my applications and just to see how it plays out uh, to write Qt in a modern way and just also have the code base behind that be in a modern way. Um, so my lightning talk was about an experiment I did with a library which is called Vertigris, uh which enables Qt to be usable with templates in contexts where QObject and signaling and uh, slots plays a role. Like everything which you do with your eye, etc., in the models. Um, and my hope is with that to be able to implement like a generic UI template library for Qt, or also other libraries. You could just so one one of the ideas is to to have different backends. So right now I use Qt as my backend because I just know Qt and I don't have to pay any uh, time into working through a new. UI library and I have used Qt for years and it just makes very, very much sense to me to keep using Qt as a platform because all my code is based on it. And But you simply could take this library, which I'm probably going to put on GitHub next year then when I just start working with, with GitHub, etc., um, to use it and write like a backend for some other UI library like I don't know if it's like applicable to the way you program with EM GUI, but you could like write a backend for WX widgets. Maybe, yeah. That's um, yeah. I mean, I, I obviously like agree. Like, you need a project to uh, to really get you trying the features and and learning new things for sure. Project that you're interested in. Okay. So, are there any other changes you want to talk about with Meaning C++ um, that you wanted to share, Jens? Um. I think there's not much that I can talk currently about. So right now in October, um, maybe that's a, a topic we could talk about, like crunch. Crunch is currently like really in the media, and I'm experiencing this currently for for my conference. I like crunch every every October. October is my crunch months for the conference. Like your personal schedule crunch, yes. like you're working a hundred hours a week kind of thing. Right. Hmm. I don't I don't count it, but I also go out, etc. Too. I I, try, I know that I have to have counterpoints, but um, yeah, I just think that you know improving working conditions and uh, that's important. But every every year for the conference, I kind of have to go through six weeks where through deadlines, etc. It becomes kind of crunch-like because I have to do everything and, and uh, a lot of things. And on the other hand, I'm I'm working on some things um, that make my, my my life easier. So one one thing which I still want to implement for the conference is a system where the speakers upload their slides or give me a link to their slides and then I just, you know, still have to okay that and then there's like another script which lists the slides of the conference. Right. Um, 
until now I used to, to send the uh, slides to, to, to some email, uh, same for my conference, and then I put this, upload the slides to the website and link them and then um, I try to improve that process for, for both sides that speakers just have to upload it on the web form and then are just basic, basically automatically done and listed without me just having to, they, they don't have to, to wait for me and doing some work and listing that somewhere else. Yeah, that's one thing that has surprised me uh, this year for CVPCon is it's still a surprisingly manual process for uploading our slides. We send an email, yeah. but yeah. they're all hosted on GitHub. There's no reason why it couldn't at least just be pull request. Yeah. Let the maintainer go click, okay, merge. But Yeah, so that's like one goal of my conference, or one goal for me is just to, to have meeting C++ to be as much as possible in, in, a, in a way automated and low friction. All right. I just yeah, just a few days ago, I got the question from Hannah, your last guest. Uh, she still needed to uh, register for the conference, and I was like, no, actually, when you submitted your talk, I got all the data from you. I need it, and you are automatically registered, and I don't have to send you a link and say, please register for the conference. Makes sense. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I still actually need to register for C++ on C, even though I am giving a class <laughs> and speaking at it now. <laughs> okay, well, it's been great having you on again today, Jens. Yeah, thanks for very much enjoyed talking to both of you. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Left to Kiss on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Site at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.